get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Jim Shields. He's co-founder of Board Meetings International. It's a company that specializes in retreats for entrepreneurs and their children that focus on deepening the relationship between parent and child through experiences, as you can see through the surfboard in the back, some of the experiences. In his 20s, exactly, in his 20s, Jim partnered with best friend Brian Scrone, and they've been best friends since three years old, which is crazy, and they went on to create a multi-million dollar real estate company that generates over $15 million per year, and he's the best-selling author of the book, Fire Sale. Jim, thanks for joining me. Thanks for being, I really love being here, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I always like to go with a fun fact, and I had a few written down from my research, which I didn't know, obviously. Um, you are good at imitations. Yes, and it used to drive my teachers crazy. So I could do imitations, so uh, it's just something I can hear. Who's Usually can hear someone's voice. Who's your favorite person uh, to imitate? There's so many people. I think uh, one of my fun ones for um, for a connection for you and I, you and I met at Mastermind Talks. Yes. And Philip, Philip McKernan's a good friend of mine. So I, I like to go into the Irish accent <laughs> and say, I, I have a passion. It's a passion that goes deep. And I don't want to, f- I can't swear actually, but it, and so I can get into <laughs> to the Irish accent pretty well. I'll have to uh, clip that and send it to him, see how accurate <laughs> it is. <laughs> He knows. I've, we've sent videos back and forth to each other, imitating each other. So um. He was powerful. He was powerful. And I'm excited to hear from you because just the fun facts that I wrote down, um, which we can talk for hours on if we had hours right now, but um, the fa- I, I read and listened to that your dad was suffering with kidney issues. And you know when I met you at Mastermind Talks, I'm like, Jim is one of the nicest people. And now I realize... I was way far off because you donated your kidney to your dad. Yeah. Yeah, I did. <laughs> so what was going on with your dad at the time and, and how that – it's not an easy decision to make. No, it's it's not an easy decision. But my dad uh, developed a, a, a kidney condition um, from being a stubborn Irishman who didn't get antibiotics when he got strep throat years mm-hmm. and years and years and years ago. Uh, and it was an old strain of strep throat. It can lodge in your kidneys and, and cause kidney issues mm-hmm. later in life. Fortunately, that happened. So it wasn't hereditary or anything. Um, and the doctors, it'll be next week, will be three years. Two wow. years ago, three years ago, he had two years to live. Um, wow. And he was on dialysis. And, and we're right near the Mayo Clinic, thankfully, the best in the world. And they gave us the choice. They said, if you have a donor, and it was pretty obvious. I, you know, I have older sisters. They have big families and... Uh, I just said, this one's, this is about, I need to do this. Wow. Um, my wife was supportive and, um, you know, I did the research, uh, like, like I think you probably would, you know, with a health condition, it didn't affect my longevity. It didn't affect me having children, uh, nothing. So, you know, the, before we figure out what's next, figure out what's important. And, yeah. uh, and I just, I would never forgive myself if I didn't try. So what was the toughest part about the process of of donating the kidney? The, the, the toughest part was, um, I think, mentally preparing. I mean, they. I wanted to say, uh, tell me exactly what's going to happen. Right. You know, and, and with what they were going to do, where they, they cut through your stomach and they have to expand your stomach and suspend your organs. And take, I mean, they're I mean, taking your one of your organs out, for God's sake, Jim. <laughs> yeah. That's a serious it's, thing. So just mentally preparing for that journey was yeah. serious. Um, and also, you know, I had to be, even though there's a lot of things in place, there's a lot of um, success rates, you have to be prepared to die. Yeah. And I had to be prepared for my dad to die. He was you know, 77 years old, um, you know, in great health. We have longevity in our family. That's a blessing. Yeah. But 
um, besides this odd kidney thing. Um, and then you had to be prepared to die. So I had some affairs in order. You know, it was very hard on my wife and my children to explain, you know, it was. Yeah. What do you tell your kids in that situation? Um, to be honest, we, we, we kept them involved, but we didn't over involve them. Mm. Um, because we wanted them to know, but they, and, and they were so good. My boys were so good. It's before my daughter was born. They just said, we're really happy he's going to be able to save grandpa, but we don't want him. We, we're not sure we really want him to do this because we're scared. Mm. So it's, right, right. It, it was, you know, it, what happens though, it's, it was a big preparation, but with any big preparation or hard thing we go through, there's a celebration. And I can tell you, Jeremy, three years ago, after we went through that, it was, some of it was really painful afterwards. You know, the recovery, you lose all your stomach muscles. Yeah. But it was it was the best holiday season I ever remember mm. because I was okay, my dad was okay. Right. Uh, it was risky. So with that, you know, mental preparation because I hate needles. I always joke I'd rather. I'm take the a same punch. way as you. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather. I said I'd rather someone run up and punch me in the face than get a needle in me. You know. So, <laughs> um, uh, so it was just it was the mental preparation and almost. You know, God forbid I ever had to say goodbye or my dad said goodbye and I was trying. And I had a good friend who tried to do a donation to, to her father about a year later and, and they lost him. Oh, man. Um, so it was – it there was no guarantees right. like in anything big you go after. And that, that was mentally it – was, it was more the mental preparation. Yeah, yeah. I ask that because I think it's so important. You know, obviously we always talk a lot about business but the reason we – we do that is for family and, and everything like that, and um, and also your mission, which we'll talk about behind you know board meetings. Um, but you have too many interesting thoughts for me to, to go right to board meetings. You know, one was you had this amazing post on second place myth of adoption. Um, so I want yeah. to hear you know hear your thoughts on that and the adoption process for you. Yeah, yeah. My my wife and I met years ago. The boys were both very young. Um, seven and five, and she was married and divorced with full custody of the boys um, for for good reason. And um, you know, when you come into children's life at seven and five, opposed to birth, it's different. It's as awkward as asking a girl to dance at the seventh grade dance. You know, and, <laughs> I was um, awkward, yeah. <laughs> okay, and I was one of them. So I was a wall um, and. Um, but the boys got on, and I got on famously. It was a big driving force behind the board meetings strategy and how we became closer. Mm. And when, when my wife and I had our daughter, who just turned a year a couple weeks ago. Nice. Congratulations. Um, I, that's thank you, thank you. Yeah, she's she's a she's a highlight to the whole family. We all just love love the interaction. Uh, and the boys have been so good, and, and we had developed this bond um, that was just intense. Uh, in a good way. We just, we loved each other. We were pals, my poor wife, <laughs> um, you know, with the, the three of boys and she's ousted. Yeah. Oh, she's, she's in this fraternity, the poor girl. Now Maggie, our daughter's helping, you know, she's it praying out. for a girl. Maybe. <laughs> oh, no. she, she so deserved it. Um, that post I wrote shortly after Maggie was born. Right. Because I hadn't, I hadn't gone through the birthing process, Jeremy, the same way that you and your wife have with your children. I'd gone through it through adoption. Right. And there is that fear, and I had heard it, and I had thought it, that, you know, the second place myth of adoption, mm. that adopted children are not as close to you as biological. Mm -hmm. And the day after my daughter was born in the hospital, my wife said, what's going on? She, she can read me really well. And I said, I, I, that was so incredible, the, the birthing experience. But I feel no different for, for Maggie than I do for the boys. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and I had to think about it and digest it. And, and there's so many people like in our, our different networks that have blended families or have adopted. Right. And, and, or there's children, people that, that we even are, are, are associates with that have been adopted. And there's this, I think there's this, Thing in society where they say they're second place, like a stigma like, type of thing, like a stigma, yeah. and and uh, um, you know, and I know there's th that they they feel like they're 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 a little bit distant than, yeah. than the biological. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. I mean, with everything in my heart, and I think it comes down to like I talked about when you when you step in um, to a child's life like that, and you go all in. I mean, you go all in with that vulnerability that they might not love you back and all that, but right. you go all in. Yeah. There, the, the, the imaginary line between biological and and uh, adoptive disappear. 
and there becomes no difference. Yeah. And, and I thought that was important for me to write to my sons, to write to other people, um, to write to, to uh, anyone who had been adopted. And that was probably one of the most important writings that I've ever done. Yeah. And I got note after note, and it's just adoption is not second place. I've mm-hmm. been at a, I, I feel so fortunate, Jeremy, that I've been on both sides. I have, I have biological children, and, and we actually want to have more, and I have two adopted children. Mm-hmm. And I honestly see no difference. And mm-hmm. I think if you ask them, they would say, well, what are you talking about? Yeah, that's, we're a family. Right. Uh, right. I, just, I just thought that was important. So I appreciate you reading that. Um, yeah. that, was, that was over a year ago I put that out, but probably one of the most heartfelt things yeah. I've ever read. It was amazing. And um, so what was the first inklings of board meetings? Because obviously, you know, at the time, you have two sons and you're trying to bond with them and, and uh, be with them and have a cohesive family. What was the first signs before you started board meetings of implementing some of the things or, you know, bonding? Because obviously it's about, exper- you know, experiential experiences with, you know, parents and kids. Yeah, it was, it's actually interesting. Um, before the boys and then before my father got sick and, and all this was going on, I, I was in a pretty lucky situation where I was getting invited back to a lot of personal development and wealth creation events um, at a pretty young age because Brian and I started the real estate business at a young age. Yeah. And, and Jeremy, it's, it, it was sad to watch. I was at an interesting time because I was younger than most of the people there but a little older than these people's children, if you got me. I was closer <laughs> in age to their children than I was to, to them. Right. Um, and there was such a disconnect um, where all these people were figuring out what's next, what's next, what's next, and they were forgetting what was important. Mm. And they, they were, and I would always teach in very simple terms, fifth grade level, because that's how I learned. And people come up and say, I wish my son or daughter had been here. And the people would just start to open up to me. Mm. And, and I just would say, wow, this is, and this would include the people on stage. Yeah. What you know, were you, you talking closer. about at the time? Well, it, our core business is real estate investments. Right. But, you know, I would spend maybe if I had 50 minutes, I'd spend 10 minutes on the strategy and four, 40 minutes on the things that support the strategy. And that goes to the foundational stuff, mm-hmm. you know, overcoming hard times, hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the things that, that would keep me grounded, just lots of different yeah. things. I believe I would really go into relationships with people and personal development because mm-hmm. I just think those are two important things yeah. not taught in school that we all need to keep refreshing right, on. Right. And well, so what kept that, you grounded? What were you? What would you talk about or what do you do now that keeps you grounded? You know, I think the things that, that keep me grounded, uh, Jeremy, were and, – and I'm not perfect by any means, but I, I've always valued relationships first. Yeah. You know, I, I love I, – I just think the power is in relationships – and if you can have real authentic ones, not only in business, but in personal life, you're going to be better off. You're going to be more successful on both sides. Yeah. Um, and, and then I think it's choosing your heroes wisely. You know, I'm going to give you a shout out. Um, reading through Mastermind Talks, I told you. Uh, I, I thought, you know, that's kind of weird to say. And I'm going to say no when we were emailing back and forth. But your story about your grandfather touched me. Hmm. That's the person that's been in your life that you truly knew and and. And that's who you wrote about. You could have wrote and written about any other. You've interviewed some incredible people, you, you know, and, and you, you've been close to some people that are on the cover of Time Magazine and this and that. You wrote about your grandfather. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's a common value that we share. And I really, th- I mean, when it all comes to the end, who's going to be most important to us? It's family and close friends. Right, right. And my heroes, usually the same way you wrote about your grandfather, have usually stayed within those people. Sure, I look up to the Richard Bransons and that and, but they're not my heroes. Right. Usually the heroes are the people like your grandfather that have been close, that have really set the example. And they've, they've opened up that in a vulnerable way to show us who they are. Um, and that's just a value that I've, I, I think has really been helpful for me to, to move through tough times, to stay grounded, to stay uh, hopefully humbled. Uh, you know, yeah. no one's perfect on that, but I think that's yeah. what's helped. So tell me about the, your heroes growing up, your mentors. First of all, where did you grow up and – what was what was life like as a, a child for Jim? Well, uh, I grew up middle class, um, North Jersey. So again, in post the nations, if you want me to talk about the coffee, I can talk about the coffee. <laughs> no, I'm not being head up on the boulevard, but all right, forget about it. But so um, so I grew up in North Jersey, middle class. Um, you know, loving family, uh, not a perfect family. We had different times where money was tight. Uh, and I learned about you know the, the the power of financial resource, how it could help 
uh, or hinder. Um, but some of my heroes growing up were definitely – uh, my own dad, because he lost his father when he was six, mm, wow. and it was only only till a few years ago that I finally told him. Not once did my did my pops ever say, "Well, I didn't have a dad. I didn't have a dad." Mm. Never once did I hear him play that card. Uh, and then and then my um, my two grandfathers. My one grandfather lived into his nineties, was a successful entrepreneur, yeah. big hearted. At his funeral, I had business associates come up and tell me stories about him that. Mm. Have still stuck with me. Really, uh, and then and then my other grandfather. Who what I was never the story met. about him? One of the reasons I was talking to someone the other day is one of the reasons I do this actually is obviously for the audience and to learn from you, but it's also for the, for you or whoever to to leave a legacy and they can you know, go back and, and hear your stories. So I'd love for you to tell something about your grandfather, sure, that people could learn from. Sure. So my grandfather was a successful entrepreneur. He actually started the business Cloth World, um, which, was, which was a big chain of stores years and years and years ago. Mm. Um, but before that, he was the president of a company called J.J. Newberry. They were like the, the original five and dime stores all over the country. Wow. And he worked his way from stock boy to president. Um, you know, the classic case start, you know, left school in seventh grade to help the family and, and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he built his way up to president. He's working, I believe it was in New York City, and it was Christmas time. And he had a habit of every Christmas before people went home for the short couple day breaks, he'd go around and shake everyone's hands, talk to them, and wish them a Merry Christmas. Yeah. Um, he got pulled into a meeting, like an emergency meeting, for about two hours. Um, and and he thought, okay, well, darn it, I'm going to miss saying goodbye to everyone and wishing them Merry Christmas and all that. And this is the associate telling me because yeah, yeah. it was a big part of something he liked to do. And he got pulled out of this meeting. The people were allowed to be dismissed early and go home. So this meeting started right when he was about to go down. Hmm. He came out and went down onto the corporate floor where, where all the people were. And even though they were all allowed to leave two hours earlier, not one person has left because mm. they all wanted to say goodbye to him and wish him a Merry Christmas because wow. they look forward to that moment. That's amazing. So I, I think that said a lot for his character. Yeah. And I know he also walked away from, from some positions of running the company because he didn't agree with the way that people were being treated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that just always stuck with me. Yeah. Uh, I thought, wow, these people had that much respect where they had the chance to run for the doors and they said, no, I want to say goodbye to John. So um, that... That's one thing about my grandfather, and then my other grandfather. When my father passed away when he was six years old, you know, the last thing he was saying to my dad, a six-year-old, called him over to the bedside and said, "You know, I'm going to be going away." Mm. Uh, he had just started a couple of successful businesses in upstate New York. They had moved from the Bronx to upstate New York, and then had moved back when he got sick. He had to get rid of the businesses, and he just, you know, he's, to my dad, he said, "I want to stay. I want to stay. I, there's nothing anyone can do, though." He had been gassed in World War One. The gas Warfare caught up with him years later with oh, wow. rare stomach cancer. Yeah, and uh, just my dad telling him that story, I thought, wow, here's a guy who was in his early 40s, had to say goodbye to his wife That's and horrible. three children. Yeah, yeah, and, and he just he did it with grace and class, and just said, I love you. I'm going to miss you, you know, and I'll I'll be here for you. Yeah. Um, then my dad at our last retreat that just this weekend, my dad actually, my my mother came for a little while, and people asked him to share. He said, you know, I'm 81 years old now, and I still miss my dad every day. Wow. So it that's shows really that, powerful. Oh my god! It is. It shows that things again. There's the uh, again. This retreat this weekend was great. I learned something new every time. Yeah. And, and a big subject that came up from from a, a friend of ours that uh, that was at the retreat. He said that you know we have our our eulogy credentials and we have our resume credentials. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I forget he learned it from some book or some talk, and he's been going deep into it. And he said, you know, which one really matters? Um, at the end, and, and, and even all the way through, because you don't know what the end is. That's a good is. way of looking at it, yeah. Yeah, it's those two different things. So I just thought, wow, those are eulogy credentials that my dad is 81 now, he's six years old, and he still remembers this man very well for, for the, the moments he had with him. So I yeah. thought if I could combine the two grandfathers who, who just stayed graceful through the worst, and then my other who was you know, a good entrepreneur but a, and a good man, that's why they're my heroes, yeah. um, you know. And I got to know them uh, not only through stories of my one grandfather, but the other mm-hmm. grandfather I got to spend quite a bit of time with before he passed away. I was about twenty when he died, so we had lots of time together. Yes. Yeah. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna be selfish 
uh, even though it's your interview, you because yeah. uh, many people probably don't know about your grandfather. Yeah. Tell me a quick two minute about him, if you would, please, because yeah. the story touched me, and I think you have to share sure, it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so for a long time, people would ask me what motivated me, you know, and what drives me, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to put my finger on it, and then I finally realized that it was, which I didn't share for a long time. Actually, because it's a very personal video. So my grandfather was in the Holocaust and survived. And um, the Holocaust Foundation did a uh, video interview with him. And I still have it and watch it. And I decided to put it on my about page. Um, you know, even though it was personal, I thought it was a big part of my driving force and important to me. So I put it on the about page to share it. And um but I always think back to appreciation and being grateful for him surviving and his whole family, except for his brother, you know, being uh, um, put to the gas chambers and what they had to go through and think why well, to have appreciation and be grateful for what I have. Because when he was 16, he was, you know, f you know, they lit a fire in his house and he was living in the woods for three weeks and, and all the stuff he went through. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of, I just always see that and have that appreciation, gratefulness, like whatever happens today, you know, I have to be grateful for that because of what he went through. But uh, yeah. yeah, but that is like a rare moment where I ever talk about myself in an interview. So thanks. Thanks for asking, Jim. But I'm, Sorry, putting, I'm putting it back <laughs> on you for a second. You know, we <laughs> talked about your grandfather and now what about your dad? What did you learn from your dad um, as, a, as a dad and a mentor? Uh, my father um, was was always good to his family. My my grandfather might have died at a very young age. My grandmother lived into her mid nineties, and he always kept her active and part of the family. Mm -hmm. Was good to her right to the end. Um, and my dad, since I was a young kid, and he had he was a salesman and struggled in businesses and that. But even through struggles or hard times, he really drilled in my head since I was younger. He said, "I want to see you have freedom and happiness." You need to go off and do something on your own in, in order for that to really happen. Mm. So he always supported me doing something on my, on my own. He always supported entrepreneurship for me. And he had the foresight to tell me that from a young age yeah. and start introducing me to the Napoleon Hills and the Dale really? Carnegie's. Wow. Oh, all that stuff. So, so that, was, that was instrumental. Um, because when, when you're that age and you're, you know, you know everything at the age of 11, of course, um, yeah. you know, and it, it plants in you, you don't want it, but it kind of festers in you and then it starts to bloom. So my dad was a big part of that, going off on my own, having the courage to do that even through hard times and, um, and, and with people. He was always very good with people. I, my father's a gentleman. He's an Irish, yeah. little Irish leprechaun gentleman. And, and I strive to be that because I can be more hard headed or hard in certain situations. And so I strive to be more like that. Yeah. So, Jim, what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were young? Wow. I wanted to be an impersonator. I think. Did you really? No, <laughs> no I don't think okay. so. I, I, could have, I mean, I was class clown, not likely to succeed. So Really? Uh, yeah, I was class clown. So, again, uh, we, we laughed. We were very lucky through a friend of a friend to get invited back at, uh, to speak at Harvard uh, last year, uh, do a business talk at Harvard uh, mm -hmm. based around the board meeting strategy. And, uh, and the big joke was there are many substitute teachers rolling over in their grave right now. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I really wanted to do something on my own. Yeah. I, I, that was programmed into a young age. I yeah. wanted to, I loved working with people. Um, I loved events and, uh, and I wanted to do something on my own. That was, yeah. that was really clear. So I wasn't sure what it was. What kind of jobs did you have growing up and then into your, cause you uh, started your bit, your real estate business pretty young, like 20, you were. Yeah, Early twenties, yeah, yeah. That's one thing I I always worked a lot, yeah. um, and and I think that with my kids I want to do it a little differently. I want them to work, but I want to work for themselves. But I I had jobs, and and probably the worst jobs that you yeah, know. Tell so me I the had. worst job. Tell me about the worst job. Uh, I you mean, know, I I worked at at Wendy's in college. Um, and you had to put on this uniform and you'd be serving a lot of, you know, good looking girls and stuff. And it just was really uncomfortable. So that, <laughs> that was pretty bad. That doesn't sound um, that bad. You have free food and, and good, good looking women. What's the worst yeah. one? <laughs> like, but you're in this funny uniform. Oh, so I gotcha. Not, I gotcha. Uh, you're not really, uh, and it just, it, it, it was low pay. It was off hours. And, uh, 
so I didn't I didn't really enjoy that and just the grease and then you know, I, I, I haven't eaten at a fast food place in I don't know how long but mm -hmm. uh, that that was a pretty unenjoyable plus the, the pay was very low uh, I did I did construction uh, in in the winter uh, during my six week breaks between fall semester and spring semester at college and that was you would literally be out the door at quarter to six every morning you get home about seven o'clock at night and just fall asleep. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I always worked really hard. I was a very hard worker. Yeah. I drove limos. I caddied. I uh, worked at the local supermarket. Um, so I learned at a very young age of having bosses and being yeah. stuck in kind of a, a dead end situation right. that I didn't want to do that. You know, I think a lot of people don't realize. And look, there's good ways to work for other people. Don't get me wrong. But for me, just the way I'm um, built with freedoms, just just yeah. wired of my own decisions yeah. of. What, of time. It's your schedule. dad was playing Napoleon Hill for you from a young age. You've been uh, I, you've been I brainwashed. Was, exactly. In a I good way. Exactly. I wasn't the most um, the most regimented, let's say, person to have working there. Or so I I, I just um, it it taught me at a young age, Jeremy. I did want to do something on my own. Where mm -hmm. I think some kids, if they've never had a job. Um, and they have that entrepreneurial spirit and they finally get their first job at 23 and I know there's people like that. I'm like, holy cow, are you kidding me? They don't realize till they're 30, oh, working for someone else isn't that bad. I knew. I was like, this isn't for me. I right. need to do something on my own. Yeah. So, you know, and those jobs, those jobs are big and, and that, that doing that construction, you know, carrying, digging out um, uh, foundations where the snow had fallen in and, and having to lift snowfuls of, of garbage cans and hoist them up eight feet and the other person would grab it. I mean, you were just knackered. You were yeah. out of it. So I thought, you know, my body's going to be shut down by the age of right. 40. Right. I'm 40 now. So that was, it was just a big lesson of, yeah. of what did I want to do? I wanted to be the person more investing in the house being built than actually right. the one, you know, doing the, doing the grunt labor. Right. You know, it makes me think of a few things when you talk about your dad and he was introducing like Napoleon Hill and some of these other people when you're a young age. And when do you think is the a good time to introduce those type of mindset and, and those type of audios or, or books to kids? Cause I know you have definite, um, opinions on education. And I want to talk about one of your blog posts on that. But first, when do you think people should start to introduce and how those type of leaders and, and mindset? You know, I think that um, it is never too early to start introducing personal development, financial intelligence, entrepreneurship, and relationships with people at mm -hmm. any too young an age. But definitely by the age of five and six, um, the education's a lot better now than when my dad was there, you know, with the old tapes and just things. Right. There's actually games and stuff. Right. Um, so like for, for our boys, when, when we first got together and, and Leland was five, we started playing um, Cash Flow for Kids, which is a mm. rich dad game yeah. from the Kurosaki group. Yeah. They, they've done a great job with it. It, okay. it makes a lot of sense. Um, the Seven Habits of Happy Kids, which is from the Covey, found, uh, mm -hmm. Covey group, Stephen Covey, um, these things in a game fashion, yeah. you're not lecturing, you're, you're not making them read tough manuscripts, they're, they're playing a game and yeah. learning with that. It's almost like that Mr. Ma Miyagi approach, but it's a lot more fun than painting the fence or waxing the wax <laughs> right. so, so, um, so game form, I think by the age of five or six, you can absolutely start. Yeah. And... You know, you also have a, a really good uh, post on the decisions and challenges and lessons from a 12-year-old leaving school. Um, talk about the decision-making process leading up to that because it's not an easy decision. And then how you go forward with, you know, actually educating your child. Yeah, I. So I, I love education, Jeremy. That's how I met you. We were engrossed in education for three days together. Right. We absolutely loved it. It's masterminding. It was it was real tangible stuff that you could use, and that's what I want to see more education about. And I yeah. think that formal education has fallen behind. Um, it's almost like we're still teaching telegraph classes, uh, and and we're using iPhones. It it just doesn't work. Um, but when you when you build a house, you have to have a strong foundation. And what I've gotten really clear after I left college, that's when I became a student, when I started to invest my own money into real education that I needed to use, the Napoleon Hills and Dale Carnegie's and, and, and other entrepreneurial um, education. What I found was missing 
is school, I think, is built in a house with no foundation. They've put up the walls and the roof without a foundation. And in order to dig a foundation and help our children have it better than us and go in the direction that they decide to go or they're passionate about, no matter what direction they go into, they're going to need three things. They're going to need personal development. They're going to need financial intelligence, which includes entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. even if they work for someone or not. And they're going to need people skills, relationship skills. Yeah. And this, this will not only support them in success in more of the resume area, like I was telling you about, yeah. but ha happiness. Uh, again, all the most successful people I, I see are consistently digging deep into these three areas, personal development, skills with people, relationship skills, yeah. financial intelligence. I mean, you talked about Philip McKernan, who I love to joke about, but he's a good friend of mine. And he goes, into, why are so many people wanting to go to his retreats? Why are entrepreneurs coming to our retreats on this? Well, it hits on these three things for our children right. and for ourselves. So I think that if your son wants to be an entrepreneur or daughter or doctor or engineer or any of that, they can do that. But they will be a better whatever they want to be with those three skill sets and they'll be happier with those three skill sets. So I want to, what I've decided to do, Jeremy, is, is there's enhancement curriculum and there's core curriculum, right? Yeah. So you were a doctor. There were certain things that were core curriculum and more enhancement. Um, for, for, for my sons and for our family, and I couldn't find a school that did it, we, we like the Montessori programs. My wife is trained in Montessori and Waldorf. Yeah. Um, but once he hit seventh grade, we couldn't find anything where the core was those three subjects. Mm -hmm. So the only thing we're trying to reverse is I want the core of his education to be personal development, financial intelligence, and relationship skills. Yeah. And then everything else will build off of that. Right. Whether he, he loves animals, so he might go your route of the doctor, but more like towards a vet. Right. He might do this. But if he has those skills, those are going to support him in any direction. Yeah. You know, for, for me, for you, biology was probably useful. For me, knowing I was going to be an entrepreneur who's a class clown you know, impersonator and doing real estate, it wasn't necessary. Um, right. So you, you see what I'm saying? For How sure. We, we want to be able to apply what we learn. Yeah. And that's not always the guarantee of formal education. Yeah. yeah. It's almost you want to build that core and then go off of whatever interests of that person, kind of build on that, you know, what el whatever else they are good at and they like and kind of build on that for their strengths type of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what is your son's opinion, you know, on that? When you go to him and say – all right, you have the school. Now we're going to do it, you know, do it on our own with you. You know, he was he was excited because he's he's a tour, he's attended our board meetings retreats um, and been active in them for a few years now. So these are the core things that we work on. Mm -hmm. um, so he sees the validity of it. He started to experience it. So he was kind of excited. They like the idea of homeschooling. We travel, so we've said, you know. With leaving the private school of the Montessori and going to the public, you know, we're not going to have the freedom to travel and this and that. And he wanted to start his own business. So he was excited for, for a lot of the things to teach on and, and the time we're spending together. Him and I do beach lifeguard training, which is something he wanted to do twice a week. So it's fun. The, the tough thing that we're still working out, Jeremy, is socializing. Yeah. You know, obviously people skills and relationships are very important. So I want to make sure he's still getting socialized. So we're mm -hmm. still setting up those group meetups with, with other parents. He's very involved with an athletic team and going into flag football in two mm -hmm. weeks. So social outlets are so important. He's seventh grade, so he's going to want to see other girls besides his mom. You know what I mean? It's that yeah. fun, awkward stage. <laughs> so we're getting him involved with a um, with with a local youth group thing. So we we want to make sure there's there's time for the socializing. So we're still mm -hmm. figuring that part out. Yeah. Um, but uh, but but I think him and I have enough talks and using our board meeting strategy where I just say, I love you guys. And I want to see you have it better than I did. And, and sometimes I remember doing homework that never did anything for me later in life. This type of stuff of mm -hmm. working on yourself, it's going to make a difference. And I might not always be here. And this is the stuff that I can really impart to you that it's going to help. And, and, mm -hmm. and I've built that trust where they believe me and he digs deep into it. I mean, his curriculum right now, his core curriculum is very different. Um, so Yeah, um, tell me about like a day. What's a day look like for him for, for school? Okay. Well, he remember he still has the everything else. Um, so we go through Florida Virtual School. He he was able to pick his classes around things that he was interested in. He wanted to do. I know he does guitar. He does uh, math, which he's he's good at and, and does a lot of. 
Um, he wanted to do business keyboarding where it's teaching Excel and things like that. Mm -hmm. and these are all things he picked. So it's yeah. great stuff. So that's the everything else. I don't get involved with that. My wife does that. Uh, and we have a, a different teachers that, that step in and, and help with mm. that. Very inexpensively, too. So for anyone saying, oh, well, sure, he can afford it. This is so affordable now. Yeah. It's, it's crazy to get this help. But the core stuff. So this semester, for these 90 days, um, and then we'll be going into the next one in about two weeks, was based off of, again, personal development, entrepreneurship. Mm. This skills. is really cool, Jim. I love hearing about this. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, and I, know, I know how much you love your kids. Yeah. So, um, so again, we decided a tree should grow where it's planted. So we talked it out with him. We listed out a bunch of different things that we could go into. Um, and his core thing for, for this first semester mm -hmm. was rich dad, poor dad for teens. Mm-hmm. And uh, the seven habits of highly effective teams with the workbook that is phenomenal. Hmm. So what we're doing is he has to go through those. I could actually send you the schedule. I think we had it. Uh, yeah, that. that's really yeah, that's really cool. So, so he goes into those, um, and he's doing the workbook, and we play one of the two games every other week. So again, it's really ingraining. Plus, we said you have to. We want you to pick a business to build. So mm. years ago, he had a, they had a pet chicken. He wanted to do chickens again because we went to Australia to see our entrepreneur friends there who have been on our retreats. They had a little chick, uh, chicken egg business. I didn't know anything about chickens, okay? He said, I want to have a chicken egg business. So my wife and I are in the investor. Now right here, right out, out here, we have 15 chickens in a coop that we've built. Where our is it? Is it like outside or where, where do you keep yeah, it? Oh, okay. Right. We're in Florida. So yeah, 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 yeah. Chickens are <laughs> they can fine, live. So. Yeah. so right under the tree fort, I'm looking out right now, is the tree fort, and then we have our deck, and then below it is the chicken coop we built. Yeah. So a chicken, a chicken egg business was perfect, Jeremy, because it has simple income, simple expenses. Yeah. My wife and I are the investor. He has to pay us back. So honestly, I don't care if the business is successful or not. It's the lessons he's going to learn. Right. So these last 90 days, he's – started that from getting the wood supplies to doing this to building the business from figuring out what money he has to borrow from us to who his clients are going to be in the area right, where right. the eggs have just started laying in this last week really final. yeah and so now all the neighbors are lined up my business partner lives a block away he's so we the eggs are pre-sold so it's not going to make a killing but it's the mechanics yeah. so that's a big part of it and he's using those you never things. know he could have yeah. his own brand at the grocery it, store or something Alden, Alden's egg business I, I don't know Alden's but, eggs that has a certain ring yeah. to it actually it does and you know what's funny at this retreat our friend Xander was here with, with his son Ronan and he just sent a, a, a picture saying look what Ronan did and Ronan had scratched on a piece of paper start, they live up in Canada They're, he's going to start an egg business he was writing out the things really he said and all, been talking yeah so wow. it's Again, it's a great sample thing. So there's a lot of experience stuff. So he's going deep into those two books right now that I think cover all three personal development, mm. skills of people, and financial intelligence. Um, and he also, we said, we want you to pick a business and we want you to pick a service act. Um, and he loves animals and he's so good with them. We have, we're, we're like Dr. Doodler here. We have three dogs, a cat, a, a two birds, a rabbit, a now chicken. A chicken coop. <laughs> yeah, it's freaking crazy around here. Like it's Dr. Doolittle land. So, um, but, uh, but so he goes to safe, which is the, uh, no kill shelter mm -hmm. about 20 minutes from our house mm -hmm. and walks dogs. It was going to be every Friday morning. We moved it to every Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. So his schooling is very experiential. Um, yeah what he's learning in the, the Rich Dad Poor Dad for teens. Um, and I get nothing from Rich Dad Poor Dad. I mean, I'm not even – There's not no affiliate friend. link or going to be put on no. the page or anything. But <laughs> but it's interesting. You know, I love hearing about these resources because it's things that, you know, I wouldn't even – maybe we haven't heard of. I haven't heard of the, the seven habits of, of happy kids at all. So I'm glad you, you mentioned that. So these are yeah. really valuable. It is. And it's, it's – again, if we can play and, and let them – do less lecture, more roundtable discussions, and more experiential, I think it will so, so, uh, soak in. So we're going to Colorado this week for a week's vacation, and I have a mastermind um, with a group of people at the end. And I think my wife and I were going to be going into the next semester. So the next semester, he's almost done with both those books. Yeah. Um, obviously, the egg business will keep going and, and the service act. But I think next semester, we're going to decide from our list, okay, what do we go into next? One of the things I'm really – passionate about is something I learned from, uh, a, I don't know if you remember Denda Pandey. Um, he's a big EO speaker. He was a Hindu monk. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm, yes. I'm Hindu, but the power of meditation, which I believe in how to focus and concentrate, yes. that's something that I want to teach. Um, we're probably going to go right into Dale Carnegie. Um, things that I think are going to ground him better. 
Mm -hmm. um, so we, our goal is to pick something once a semester, and there's four semesters in the year, yeah. and go very deep in, in that. And it's only one per semester, one thing for personal development, yeah. one thing for financial intelligence, one thing for skills of people, and just keep going deeper and deeper mm -hmm. into each. Yeah. I would, I, we, we might be nuts. I don't know, but that's what we're... Well, if you're nuts, that means you're going in the right direction. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like if everyone else is doing one thing, you want to be doing the other. Uh, is, yeah. Is that so I'd love to see that schedule if you're willing to share it. If it's not private, I would oh, no. love to put it on the post and just so people get a, a sense and feel for it. Sure, I'll you send know. it right after the end. If it's too private, then don't worry about it. Or if we no. need to like fade out certain things, but I think that'd be really valuable. No, it's it's totally open. I actually yeah. posted on Facebook because a lot of people were asking, hey, what did you decide to do? What did you decide right. to do? Right. And I'm always honest. I say, we don't know what we're completely yeah. doing. <laughs> But I know that it's called entrepreneurship. You 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 <laughs> you do it on the fly, and what works exactly. you do, and what doesn't you you throw away. Exactly, exactly. So what is what do you find so far has been like if someone is going to do that? What is something to avoid or a challenge? And then what's something that you were surprised that works so well with the the curriculum and the schooling? A um, couple of things. One thing you got to get some a certain amount of structure because mm -hmm. the kids are used to that. You need that, so you know it doesn't have to be you know completely military, but you have to have mm -hmm. some sort of structure. Yeah. Secondly, we had a really good friend who's very successful businessman. We spent a week with his family in the Keys, and he's done alternative education with a mixture of keeping them in school and then pulling them out for a semester. He's mastered it to do a little of both. Yeah. And I said, "What do you recommend?" And he said, "Look, here's what I know." The starting point for everything you're wanting to do is figure out what they're passionate about right. and then dump gasoline on it and set it on fire. Right. That, was, that was his advice. Yeah. He said, so just keep focusing on that, of going deep in what they're passionate about, allow them to go there and set it on fire. Give yeah. them support, make them go deep in it, and that's it. And it might change in that, but he says that's – and his kids, what they've done, I don't have time to go into it. It's incredible. Um, you know, 16-year-old son now running, he was always a, a fisherman. He's now running fisher charters out of, out of the Florida Keys at 16 part of the year with NFL players and all that, hiring him big money to do it. I mean, wow. incredible stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's because he let them go deep in what they were passionate about and he supported it by just setting it on fire for him. Yeah. Um, so that was important. And then, and then the socializing. You know, I want to keep my kids socialized. I, I've read plenty of studies. I've had family that did homeschooling. It is absolutely a farce that your kids are, you know, they, they're antisocial if they're homeschooled. Right. That's probably I've, the biggest uh, objection people have, I would assume. It that. is, and it's and it's actually it's they've shown the opposite in a lot of studies, which we can't go into now. But it is important. They want to be around people their own age. Mm -hmm. So I'm lucky where I travel um, with certain mastermind groups, and they bring their families. We have our retreats. We're doing other things, but socializing. Don't keep them penned up. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. hormones are starting to pop around the early teens and right. that. You got to keep them socialized. So, at what point do you do you do this indefinitely till college? Do you I mean, what, what does that look like beyond like in high school, college, do, or is is there no high school or college? I don't know. I mean, if he wants to go back to school and we take it year by year, um, then maybe he goes back. But I, I'm not I'm not completely sold on college, Jeremy. I got a, a business degree in marketing from a very right. uh, supposedly a very good school in the Northeast, um, and uh, and I didn't know what a return on investment was when I left college. Right. Didn't know uh, there was there should have been a whole semester just on that if you're a businessman. Right. I think it was one little definition in economics. So not to beat up on education, my yeah. thought is depending on what they want to go into, college may be important. If they want to be a doctor, they want to be that surgeon that took the kidney out of me and put it in my dad. Gosh, I applaud these people. It's right. incredible what you guys go through. Yeah. Uh, but if they want to be an entrepreneur, Jeremy, right. I'm honestly not sure that college is the right route. I don't want to say they should be going to specialized classes and mastermind groups you know, starting now. Yeah. And yeah. that's going to help them build the business a lot better. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I want to talk about the board meetings. And I want to talk about the last one and some of the, the big breakthroughs. But, but just for people who don't know, what is it? Who is it for? And then the double meaning, obviously. Yeah. So um, board meetings became a play on words. We're all used to board meetings where it's, you know, you, you, most times you picture an old IBM office with guys in stuff suits sitting there crunching numbers in a dank corporate, you know, <laughs> setting. And, and, you know, it's changed over the years. 
So the board meeting strategy actually came about by surfing buddies of mine that were entrepreneurs and we would take surf trips together and we call them board meetings. And then it kind of evolved into more um, time with our kids where we said we're going to have a board meeting with our son or our daughter. And the board meeting strategy just means we treat our kids with the same respect and attention that we give our largest clients and investors in our business. Right. And for entrepreneurs, we can get a little lopsided. Um, so yeah. one, once a quarter um, with each of my children, I'm, I, I, I do – uh, a board meeting. It's at least four hours long um, and it's one-on-one -on -one without electronics doing a fun activity of their choice saving some time at the end for some focus reflection and communication. Mm -hmm. And fun activity with focus reflection is the shortest definition of experiential education. Mm -hmm. So basically one-on-one -on -one with each of my children I'm doing something experiential education wise every 90 days keeps grounded there's anticipation for the next one, reflection on the last one. Mm -hmm. And based off of that strategy, which a lot of our friends at Mastermind Talks yeah. use and have been helpful, we built our retreats. Yeah. Our retreats are based off the same thing. Mastermindings, Jeremy, have changed my life. I'm sure they've changed your life. Yeah. So I said, why do the kids have to wait till they're 25 to go to these? Why can't we have parents and kids come together yeah. to deepen their relationships, mastermind, and learn the things not taught in school? Yeah. So based around an oceanfront retreat where we use ocean activities like surfing and um, paddle boarding and boogie boarding and just fun things, um, we bring in up, up to 20 parent-child couples, one parent, one child, um, and we do a three-day mastermind format where we're using experiential education and very active lessons to help deepen the relationship um, but also open their eyes to the things that I hear time and time again. Most entrepreneurs really want their kids to learn, but they don't know how to teach it. Yeah. What's the minimum age that you think is proper to, to come? We've had as young as eight, but I really think 10. Um, and it goes 10 to 25. At our last retreat, the oldest person was 23. He was there with his father, and he's actually getting married in six months. So wow. that was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, that was really cool. That was a cool um, time in life to see what, what how they responded and he loved it. So, um, yeah, but about 10 is good. And, okay. and up into their early 20s is, is where we see a lot of things pop because we think that kids have been exposed to that, the things that we teach, but they really have. Right, right. So, and the way you were referring to before is your the three step connection, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, the three steps to connection are our board meeting strategy. And if you get nothing else out of this interview, all you have to do, if you have people say, I feel disconnected, you know, it's, oh my gosh, it's October. I feel like I haven't spent any time with my family. I feel like our relationship is on the surface. If you want to go deep, use this strategy. It's been proven and there's things scientifically based around it that work. Once a quarter, get one-on-one -on -one for at least four hours. One-on-one, -on -one, no electronics because that absolutely, I can't go into that now. But of what that's doing to interfere with interpersonal relationships, yeah. it's important outside it, but sometimes we got to disconnect, right. to reconnect, and then do something in front of their choice with time to communicate. I guarantee after a year of doing it, you're not going to want to stop. And I guarantee mm -hmm. reflecting back on that first year you do it and you ask your son or your daughter, you know, what were some highlights of the year? I guarantee they're going to say the board meeting where we went and did this, the board meeting where we went mm -hmm. and did that. And it really is a marker in the relationship. Yeah. So that's... That's the strategy that we try to get as many people to use as possible. And yep. we have a book. We have a book called the Family Board Meeting. Mm. Um, if uh, if anyone wants to go to www.qualitytimerevolution.com, mm. um, it's a free download, and it's actually a, a talk about a ten minute talk that I did for a guy named Joe Polish. Yeah, I watched that. Jackson. It's okay. like fourteen minutes and nineteen seconds or something like that. But yeah, uh, well, <laughs> the doc. The doctor always gives the exact time. So um, it was really good. I, I highly, yeah, I highly recommend people watch that for sure. Yeah, thank you. Well, and Jeremy, there's simply no substitute for quality time. There's not. And as entrepreneurs, we try to uh, better things. But if you want to better your relationships, you cannot substitute quality time. You can't. Not with not with fancy schools. Not with money. Not with gifts. If you want a deep relationship, there's no substitute for quality time. Yeah. And one of the things that you emphasized when you were giving that talk is it's got to be a fun activity chosen by the child. And yes. so what have your your uh, children chose? Oh, wow. We've gone to football games. We've gone to soccer games. We've gone fishing. We've climbed the lighthouse. We've gone to water slides. Um, we've gone to pet sanctuaries. We've gone to just beach days. Where we we do that, um, we've gone on a hike. Um, there's there's just so many, and and again, I encourage you to do something non-electronic, um, yeah. even if your kids like electronics, yeah. because you don't want to be 
texting each other to try to relate on these times. So, yeah. and whatever your kids are passionate about, let them go deep. But as you said, Jeremy, if, if you and I love car shows, antique car shows, and we're not going to drag our son or daughter to this thing for four hours that they're bored out of their minds and say, isn't it great we bonded? You right. can't do that. Right. <laughs> so uh, something of their choice also gives them ownership because people say, oh, my teen would never do that. Give it a try. Let them pick the activity and then maybe even go a little above, and this might anger some people, pull them out of school for the day. Right. You know, so they miss two days of school a year. What's more important when you look back 30 years from now, those days that they'll never forget or a day at school? What was the strangest one that they chose? Activity? Hmm. That you maybe had second thoughts about, about giving them the, the reins? Well, Leland, our youngest, was afraid of heights. So the two he chose, those were strange. Not, I loved them, but yeah. uh, when he went to a giant water slide and he went mm. to um, the lighthouse. Mm. Why, uh, do you, why do you think he chose that? Those? Well, because I think we, we talk about you know stepping out of your comfort zone and overcoming fears. Those were the two lessons at the end of the day when we mm. talked. I shared with him fears I had when I was his age. Mm. And uh, I think he wanted to overcome them. Plus... Um, in all honesty, Big Brother had gone to the lighthouse on his last board mm, meeting, yeah. so I wanted to be like it's a good Big motivator. Brother. Yeah, it it was, and um, and I actually write about that in our book. That that one and the water slide one were very similar, um, but the breakthrough it caused for him to overcome his fears and actually climb this um, I'd be was very. I sound scary to me actually. Yeah, uh, the steps are like so steep, <laughs> going around. It's like oh my gosh. So um, yeah, so those he, they haven't really done anything. Totally off the wall. Yeah, but that um, is a little I, bit strange considering if someone's scared of heights and they're like, "Let me go climb this lighthouse." Yeah, that's um, that's interesting. Now, I want to hear about some of the biggest breakthroughs from the board meetings. I'm sure there's tons of them. Maybe start with the last one. What were some of the big breakthroughs you saw? This was just this past week, right? This was. I literally just left the uh, surf house yesterday. Wow. So, so it's, you know, I'm back in, 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 uh, in, in full swing, but I'm still digesting. Yeah. Because when you get people in that environment where their phones are off, they're one-on-one -on -one with their child, they've traveled to come to us, it just sets the stage for connection. Yeah. And, you know, a big breakthrough for me was, was um, the, the dreaming room is huge, something that we learned and has totally changed my life. Yeah. where kids share what they're really passionate about and they have to get up and, and give a talk to the whole group. It's very supportive. Like yeah, talk, talk about the dream room. Yeah. Well, the dream room is something that we learned years ago, Brian and I, from a guy named Michael Gerber from the E-Myth. Sure. Um, yeah. And we had attended his dreaming room. And at this dreaming room almost 15 years ago, that's where our, we came up with the board meeting strategy and the retreats. We talked about them and then it took another five years to actually, or even more, to start doing them. Um, and the dreaming room is this. See, Walt Disney... The story is that Walt Disney um, used to use dreaming rooms to create Disney World. Hmm. Um, he would put himself in a room with blank canvases and say, I don't want to talk about unions or you know money problems or this or we can't and, and lack of technology. We're not going to do that. We're going to create something totally different yeah. that we're passionate about um, w without limits. And it's a very interesting space because I don't ever remember being put in that space when I was in school. Um, I don't remember my parents, even as good as they did, introduce me to Napoleon Hill, putting me in this space. So yeah. when we sit in this room, Jeremy, okay, so the age range this time was 9 to 23. Yeah, big range, yeah. Oh, big range. I spoke for about 10 minutes, had them close their eyes for about two minutes, and next thing, um, our retreat director and, and, and my business partner's wife comes down and goes, are you guys almost done? We're in the, the downstairs mastermind room. I said, no, we got to keep going. They worked diligently for over an hour on these blank canvases. Mm. I mean, a nine-year-old. Because, and I, I would just ask them questions that got them thinking. Yeah, what do you ask them, yeah. I just say, what are you passionate about? Not your parents, not not your best friends, not what people are going to think is cool, because cool fades. What are some talents you don't even like to talk about? What are things that you're afraid to write down because you don't think you deserve them? Mm. What would you like to see for yourself in, in 20 years? Mm. And, and it's a blank canvas. You write the rules. You can write it in pictures. You can write it in words, whatever you want to do. And what I do is I start by showing mine from 15 mm. years ago. And mine in 15 years Do you have years one ago, around here? Oh, I do. Oh. I do. Um, I mean, oh, here it is. Yeah, I've already put it in my drawer. So... So I say, and it's, I said, I'm going to prove to you that this works. I said, look, these are my scribble words, ADD, you know, out the wazoo. That's amazing. And You're like you a beautiful mind. Yeah, yeah, you can't, exactly. <laughs> Not as crazy, but <laughs> um, 
So basically what this side says, I'm going to build a real estate investment company. We had just started investing in our real estate mm. and build up a whole bunch of rentals. And then I'm going to start doing something called board meetings where it's parent-child retreats. You even do that then. So yeah. It all came out by setting the space in this dreaming room. Mm. And, and I said, we're going to have some surf. We're going to do fun lessons. We're going to teach mindset, money, and people skills. We're going to deepen the relationship while having fun little activity, like all these things I wrote out and I'm mm. showing the kids, I'm like, where are you right now? You're sitting in front of me. We've never known each other. And if I hadn't wrote this out, we wouldn't know each other. Right. So it's, I think it really inspires them where it's the authenticity where I've still held on to mine. It sets the um, stage, yeah. sets the stage and, and then they go deep and then they share. And one of the, the biggest rewards for me, Jeremy, is at these retreats, so many entrepreneurs, and again, we're not a troubled teen camp, you know what I mean? Mm. Most of our people, in all fairness, have a, a good relationship or a pretty good yeah. relationship. They just want to make better. Right. But even these good parents and, and entrepreneurial parents, they're busy and, and sometimes the kids haven't felt comfortable to open up, even if they have a good relationship. Yeah. When they share that dreaming board, the parents all go, I had no idea they were passionate about that. Mm. I had no idea that they wanted their life to look like in 20 years. And again, what do we all want? We want to support each other's passions and dreams. And I'm saying, right. here is the key. They've just shared what they want to do in a very focused environment. So to see the kids and parents talking about that, the other kids cheering and, and giving suggestions, yeah. it's a very magic moment. And it might seem a little woo-woo or overly holistic to some people, but hey. I don't think it seems that holistic at all. I mean, it's almost like a, a child creative way of getting their passion out and almost goal setting i hate to use goal setting as it seems too structured for that type of thing but it's it's sort of in that that direction yeah and i think in goal setting is important but again too many people set goals that aren't their own yeah. um and this gets to what are you passionate about and i'm real clear on that i said yeah. i don't i don't care what your parents want right. i care what you want and the parents know that that i say this and if they can start from that core of what they really want or things that are within them that they don't even feel comfortable talking about that they think yeah. they have a talent in now we have them, they can set goals around their deepest core values and passions. And yeah. that's when they can really mean something. But yeah, it's not an overly structuring goal thing, but it's just yeah. a vision right. that they can start to work towards. So what's so, some of the things that have come out that uh, surprised the parents that the kids wrote down? Um, there was, there was a, a boy who wanted to start a DJ business. Um, he loved music, and he since has. Um, that was a pretty cool one. There was there was a, a boy that I remember. Um, he loved space travel. He absolutely loved space travel, and um, they had no clue hmm. that he wanted to do this. And since that, he's gone to the the NASA camp and done this and all that. Um, and he was afraid to talk about it. Hmm. Uh, there was um, a couple of the older kids that wanted to get in certain types of philanthropy in their own businesses that that they, they, they thought people would laugh at them for. Uh, and then they found core support, not only from, a, a big thing is there were people that shared their endeavors, not only with entrepreneurship yeah. or, or their, their more philanthropy service side. Yeah. And what was cool in the group is I, we saw other parents step in and say, I got a connection with that. Because we're all entrepreneurs. Right, now. right. They're saying, I got a connection for that. So the fun uncle approach steps in where this, you know, other cool parent that's not my own right. has a connection. They've been able to set that up, and, and and they've connected in certain ways. There was one girl who wanted to um, do drawings for uh, I think it was DreamWorks or one of the groups, and Steve Sims said, "Oh, I right, watched oh. his video. Yeah, his testimonial yeah. with his with his son on yeah, your he, site. Yeah, yeah, he's hysterical, and he introduced this girl to someone he knew who he had done. You know, Stevie does these crazy things, and he's hysterical to spend three days with." <laughs> So, I mean, they look at him, they're like, wow, look at this cool guy. And he, he was, Steve was the fun uncle to a lot of the kids there. Um, you know, and that's when entrepreneur parents work together, what you say t to your kids, Jeremy, might not be as well received as, right. you know, the surfer with the curly, bushy hair, you know, pushing them onto a wave. I've kind yeah. of earned that. And same thing with you. Whoa, right. this cool doctor with his own show. What you say to my boys might be better received. And right, when we work right. together with that fun uncle or fun aunt approach, it yeah. really comes together. Yeah. So I've seen that a lot at the retreats before. Yeah. Yeah. One um, thing that strikes me it's really powerful is the vulnerability. How do you get them to open up like that? Obviously, you're actually really good at that, just opening up and, you know, being authentic is not really the right way to put it, but in same thing, 
with what you need these kids to open up to really see what they're passionate about. How do you foster that vulnerability and get them to open up? You know, I think um, we've cheated again just with our structure. Yeah. Where when you're when ev- every person there is one on one with one of their parents, they're in a pretty safe environment, um, and there's no distractions, and we've already had fun together. See, we don't just jump up and go right in. We we do very little lectures. It's a lot of discussions and activities, but most of the mornings uh, we're out having fun on the beach. And the old saying: once you get them laughing, you can tell them anything. So we're sharing our love of the ocean. You know, 90% of the kids might try to surf and we get them up on their first wave. So there's a fun trust with us. And then anything we teach, Jeremy, again, less is more. We teach very few lessons, but we go deep into them. And my business partner and I personally show how it changed our life. So the first day with the most, I think one of the most touching things we do is called a connection sheet between the parent and the kids. It's three questions, Mm -hmm. total game changer of the relationship. I showed them how I had done that with my dad years ago. And doing that sheet was one of the things that allowed my father to let me give him a kidney because he was a stubborn old Irishman. He said, I'm not taking a kid from right. absolutely not. And that connection sheet, honestly, Jeremy said, look at what I value in my life. If you don't let me do this, you're not letting me live on purpose. Right, right. Um, so I was almost able to use it in a good way to do something very special. And I think when you put it in there and, and I challenge them, we, we're good at challenging. To say, look, you can go light on this or you can go deep. Um, it's up to you, but here's what happened when I went deep, and and they step up. I, I just I hear all these things about teens being selfish and obnoxious, and sure they can be, but you get them in the right environment, man, mm-hmm. can they shine? So I think we just the environment and the fact that we step first and we personally show them, hey, we're not just making you do this to do this. We've done it. Here's what it did for us. Mm-hmm. You know, and we haven't talked that much about the real estate business at all. What are so a few of the big lessons? and milestones from the, the real estate business? <laughs> okay, I laugh because I had a few people that, um, that I've been doing board meetings with and they've been helping with marketing and they called me like six months ago, wait a minute, you, have the, what do, you do a bunch of real estate investments? <laughs> like, and I don't, I, even though it made our bones, I don't talk about it because I respect it. Um, I really appreciate it. It's not my, my main passion, but I, mm. you know, it, is, it is my financial resource, really. The board meetings feeds me some, but this is what feeds me. So that's why I was laughing when you said that. Yeah. Some people go, I didn't know you did real estate investments. But we actually do a large volume. Yeah. Um, and and it, again, it's a simple business model where I have one specialized skill besides our board meeting retreats, Jeremy. Mm-hmm. I can take a, a Imitations. little house. No, I'm imitate. Yeah. Oi, oi, have a passion. <laughs> Shout out my car name. Sorry. So Philip's going to kill me when he hears this interview. <laughs> I, have, I, have, uh, I have one specialized skill. I know how to take a house, fix it up, and either sell it or rent it. That's it. That's how I built all my wealth, yeah. uh, that one specialized skill. And I think therein is the lesson. Keep it simple. Um, go deep into something. I see so many people at these different events trying to go on the surface and just take a little nibble out of this strategy or that. Yeah. Yeah. We've gone really deep. And, and being able to go deep in it has been able to produce volume. You know, And people say, well, why aren't you doing apartment buildings? Why aren't you doing mobile home parks? And I say, look, after doing a thousand houses, we're just starting to get good at these. Why am I right. going to switch now and become the new kid on the block? Yeah. So I think being able to go deep into something that's not sexy, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, people are in nowadays with all these exciting businesses. Geez, you buy rental property? Yeah. You know, it's, it's just not. <laughs> it's not that fun. Um, so I think it's it's. But I I like the tangibility of real estate. I grew up near Wall Street. The, the, the stocks didn't make any sense to me, but the tangibility of leveraging real estate and sweat equity made sense to me. Mm-hmm. So I went with something that I, I thought I would enjoy and be good at. And sure enough, um, we did. And, and we almost went bankrupt in 2008. Mm-hmm. I'm very open and honest about that because, look, values dropped 60%, rents dropped 40%. It's crazy. Um, yeah. But what we did is, before we figured out what was next, oh, it was awful. It was awful. And that's seven years ago. The, hap- the, the longer we get away from 08, the happier I am business wise. But we held our feet where a lot of people didn't. Um, and I think that the thing that, that, that kept us aboard was is that saying that a, a mentor of mine taught me before we figure out what's next, figure out what's important. Mm-hmm. And when we were going through the, the turmoil of the end of 07 and the beginning of 08, those six months were, I can't tell you how hard they were. We, it, it no longer was about me and my business partner. We made a decision to say, we are going to protect our investors through this. Mm-hmm. That became our goal. Most of them were close family and friends. We said, we don't know how, but we're going to do that. 
if I had not changed it to evolve to that higher level, we would have gone bankrupt. Because so, to keep my own, my own luxuries and that, it was just too painful. I could have rebuilt. So time to you're something higher. That, you're the higher purpose. Higher purpose. Yeah. And that really helped us. And not only did it help us, but that word spread about our integrity. And then a lot of other people who wanted to get in because the market had dropped so quickly came to us to say, we know you guys can be trusted. We know you're honest. We want you to help us find investment property. Uh, can you do it? And so we were able to go through a lot of pain, but then also start to rebuild just by keeping yeah. our feet and doing yeah. the right thing. One so. big lesson, Jim, that sticks out for me when I uh, read and listen to your story is the Mr. Bill Lawyer story. Um, <laughs> yeah. That was a good one. That you you didn't take that advice. Yeah, yeah. So everyone's going to have a Mr. Bill. And you were Bill. young there. So I want you just to talk about that because what, what was going on in your, or what happened? What was going on in your mind that you, that you didn't take that advice? Uh, Mr. Bill was, we went and as you know, we saw an attorney in Santa Barbara, California. We had just started this invest, real estate investment company in Bakersfield, California, about two hours inland. We'd already done five or six successful deals, made money. Um, we said, okay, time to get corporate structure and he was referred. We went in and we started to explain to this very distinguished attorney. I mean, his, his desk was worth more than my car easily. His suit was worth more than my car. You know, I, I'm in my little Quicksilver khakis thinking right. I was all dressed up and I felt, I mean, I felt not dressed up. Uh, and as me and my business partner started to passionately explain what we were doing, he just held his hand up, started to laugh at us. And, and then he went into a very disciplined, documented argument, like an attorney will, of all the reasons our business was going to fail. Hmm. He, and, and he ended it with saying, now, I don't want to disappoint you boys, but I think you'll be back to waiting tables in a couple weeks. Right. Now, I, I wasn't even a waiter at the time, but I guess I looked, you know, I had a waiter look to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think what it was, Jeremy, is, is I had done my homework. I had been really studying hard into this. I listened to the simple numbers um, that we were taught. We had gone to some experts in it. And I was able to look at, first off, had he done any real estate deals? Had he done any real estate deals in Bakersfield, California? Was he the butcher telling me, you know, how to bake bread? Right. Like I like to say, don't let a butcher tell you how to bake bread. Right. Ask, ask the baker. And, um, and really, I think the thing that was our biggest strength is we've already done a half dozen deals and they've made money. Right. So what, what scares me about that story, Jeremy, it's a great story because we did overcome. We said we're not going to listen to, you know, the butchers tell us how to bake bread anymore. Yeah was if I hadn't done those five or six deals before I went to see Mr. Bill, would I have kept going? Right. And I don't, I don't know. Um, I yeah. don't know the answer. But uh, You validated it. Yeah. We did. We validated it. So it's, everyone is going to have a Mr. Bill. Yeah. We have to be very careful of opinions, yeah. especially expert opinions from a person who is not an expert in a certain area. Right. You know, tell, them, tell them to pound sand you know, politely and, and move on. Uh, go to the experts. Right. <laughs> You know, I love that story and I love that because it's all about taking advice, who you take advice from, how do you take advice and it could be someone who really cares about you and loves you, it could be someone close to you who's giving advice who's maybe not the expert and doesn't have experience with it. So I loved hearing that even from a young age, you guys just started and the lesson learned there. Um, yeah. Jim, I appreciate your time. This has been fantastic. Um, I could I could keep you for another hour, but I'm not going to. Um, but I have one last question, and before I ask it, just tell people where can they find out more, where should we should be pointing people towards to check out. Yeah, I mean, again, I think to, our goal is to see at least a million entrepreneurs using the board meeting strategy. Mm -hmm. So I think it can change them. So if they want to learn more about us and get a free copy of the book, The Family Board Meeting, just go to www.qualitytimerevolution.com. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to watch that talk I did at Joe Polish's annual event, get a free copy of the book, um, and even stay up to date on some of the stuff we talk about. Uh, if you're more interested in the retreats because you're saying, this sounds phenomenal, we've never heard anything like this, I love mastermind groups, I want to get my kids involved, you can go right to www.boardmeetings.com yeah. and you can learn about the retreats. We'd love to have you. It's my most passionate work. I love doing it uh, and I think it makes the biggest difference. It's, it's where I feel the most on purpose. So we'd love to have you join us. Yeah, and I suggest people check out the, the blog posts because they're really well done. Um, so Jim, my last question is, you know, you've had a lot of success in business and life and what's been one of the proudest moments for you? You talked about them, Jeremy. 
I mean, donating a kidney to my dad, no one can ever take that from me. That was, that was a tough decision. I could have walked away and had every excuse not to do it, um, but I did it. Uh, adopting my boys, um, pinnacle, pinnacle. I mean, most people are like, oh, that's the guy who cries on stage because I just, I get so emotional. Um, so that, and then not, not the business success itself, um, but the fact that in end of 2000, 2007, 2008, we stood against the fire, we did what was right, and we came out better than we did before. Right. Um, those, you know, between personal and business, those are the three um, that I really value the most in my marriage. I, I love my wife to pieces. Um, but th those would be it. Yeah. You know, and we didn't even get advice from your wife, everyone else. Oh. So, so, yeah, Shh. tell me, because she's, you know, we know she runs the show, right? So, she, what, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, what is the big lessons or what do you learn from her? Uh, my wife is is an extremely passionate, loving, um, alternative education type. Again, she's trained in Montessori and Waldorf. And she's been the one who's really helped me figure out home environments. Mm. Um, she's taught me and brought up teachings to that where, where um, one of the worst things we can do is overschedule our children. She says it's it's what it does is terrible. We're scheduling them more than the average CEO. Yeah. That's not That's okay. Yeah. And and it's okay for children to feel bored once in a while because if they're bored, that's where creativity can start to come out of it. Mm. Um, so just the family rhythms, the compassion that that she's taught me, you know, the things she's overcome in her life have been an example. Um, so she is probably the most dedicated family person and teacher I've ever seen. Uh, and it's pretty cool with our board meetings and the things she continues to do with consulting families of how to simplify home life yeah. to watch her shine in that. So, and I just learned so much from just watching her. Yeah, because she has a big role in the board meetings too. What is what are some things that she does? She she's besides my business partner, she's my main brainstorming strategy. Yeah, uh, and I always say like what she's taught me through Waldorf and Montessori education and. Um, and, and, and simplicity parenting, which she's involved with, uh, she helps structure a lot of the things. Um, she helped set up a lot of the formats. Um, when, when I write something, like Second Place Myth of Adoption, she's one of my editors. And I try to do the same for her. Yeah. So it's more, she's more of a mastermind partner. Yeah. And she's been handling certain logistics from the retreat, which she's stepping out of to focus on our family and other things. Yeah. Um, but she truly is, she brings an, uh, an, an angle of edu traditional education, formal education to it and kind of turns it on its side the way she knows that I'd want to and helps right. me see things that I wouldn't understand, which yeah. is so important. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure, I don't know if you're The best of both worlds. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Jim, this has been hugely valuable. I really appreciate uh, the time and everyone should check out uh, boardmeetings.com. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jeremy. It was a pleasure talking with you today. Always. Thanks. Take care.